So we're going to talk about beams and beams in bending. Okay, so a beam, going back to basics here, is a member that's designed to carry transverse loads. In other words, loads shown here, they're normal to the axis of the beam. This is my applied loads as it's termed here. So the loads are at right angles to the axis of the beam. That's what they're designed to do. And we have reactions of the beam, I've shown them down here, uh, showing the beam reacted at either end. I've shown an I section beam there because in a lot of structural analysis, the I section beam is used because of its, um, its geometrical properties. It's a very good, very stiff beam in bending. If you ever go into sort of a, a warehouse or you go into one of these B and Q type environments where you see, look up in the, the roof structure, you'll see the stanchions in the um, the beams in the roof, they'll all be I-section beams because they're really good, really useful for bending the beams. You think of the, the axis here, or the, an XX axis here, about that axis they are very, very stiff in bending. So they're used for lots and lots of bending applications. Other beams can be used as well, like rectangle hollow sections or simply square sections or um, circular sections, all sorts of different types of beams. And you'll see them later on in the work we're going to do. Um, but I-section beams are typically used for lots of beam analysis. Now, quite obviously, going back to looking at stanchions in, in roof structure and so on, beams can actually be mounted at various orientations. And they can be vertical, they can be on an incline, but we're going to just consider them to be horizontal in this work we're looking at, and all the loads are vertically applied. Again, the loads can be applied at angles to the beams, but we're going to keep it nice and straightforward for this, in this lecture. So all loading is vertical to the beam, all beams are horizontal. The basic principle used for analysing beams is what's called static equilibrium. And that's the most fundamental concept we use in, in static analysis. We assume that when we consider a component or a structure, that it's, it's in static equilibrium. Applying Newton's first law, if we make all the forces on the beam, they must equal to zero. They must be in what's called a balanced situation. And that's the same as you're analysing an aircraft, which is analyse a building, a table, whatever component you're considering. That's the same principle we're going to use. So there are several conditions that we need to satisfy, uh, shown over the page, when considering horizontal beams. And these are the two, what's called equations of equilibrium we're going to use. There actually are three equations of equilibrium. I'm showing two here. Um, so for static equilibrium on horizontal beams, we can just apply these two equations of equilibrium. The first equation, when we summate all the vertical forces, they must equal to zero. So that's applying Newton's first law in the vertical sense. And the second law is uh, summating all the moments uh, of a force about a particular point on the beam. That should also equal to zero for equilibrium. There's a third equilibrium equation where the summation of all the leftward forces equals summation of all the rightward forces. But we're not considering that because our beam is going to be horizontal and all our applied loads are vertical. So that equation doesn't come into play. But there are actually three equations of equilibrium, but only two we're going to use here. And they can be written in two different ways as, as well. Sometimes I write them as summation of all the vertical forces equal to zero for equilibrium. And sometimes I write them as stated there, summation of the upward forces equal to summation of the downward forces, or in notation form shown here. Um, so two ways of writing the same thing. And I'm actually going to use both with you as the session unfolds. For the um, summation of moments, we can write that in the... A form there, summation of all the moments equals zero for equilibrium, or again we could write it as summation of all the clockwise moments equals summation of all the anti-clockwise moments for equilibrium shown below. Two ways of writing the same thing, and engineers do use either in their analysis. I'll show you both here. All right, so those are the basic equations of equilibrium. They actually underpin all structural analysis with the third equation included, but we're just going to use those two today in the analysis we're going to look at. There are also different types of beam configuration. And so beams can be supported in a variety of ways, and these are two common supports shown below. We've got a simply supported beam at both ends. So there's a beam here, I've called it RL here, and RR. And those supports can be anywhere along the beam, by the way. They don't have to be at the end of the beams. They can be within the, the lengths of the beam. But there's only two of them. If you were to put a, a third support in, in the beam, which of course you can have, you can have what's called a continuous beam and have another support here that makes the analysis incredibly complex it will take us most of the lecture to probably deal with the the complexity of adding that third support in so everything you're going to see and we're going to analyze we'll just have the two supports along the beam and the second type of beam that could be considered 
is the built-in one end beam, similar to the cantilever beam here, and that's shown on the right-hand side here. That's slightly different because it's only got one vertical support, the one support of the, of the wall here. So to balance that beam, you also have to have a moment at the wall, which is shown here. So it's slightly different to the simply supported beam configuration in that all the supports are at one end and one support is a vertical reaction and one support is the moment in the wall. Whereas on the simply supported beam, it's just two simple supports uh, along the lengths of the beam. So different configurations. I'm primarily going to look at the simply supported beam in the analysis we're going to consider here. And again, loading, I'm going to look at several types of loading. The first type of loading here is called concentrated point loads. And they literally act at a point. That one point on the beam is shown below. It's a concentrated point load. P shown here acts at a point. You can think of it acting at a knife edge. I know nothing really acts really at a knife edge as such, but that's how they're considered point loads. They literally act at a discrete point on the beam uh, when they're applied here. So the point load shown to the simply supported beam. Again, we're reacting at either end here. And there's a point load applied to the end of the cantilever beam, which we're reacting by the moment in the wall and the vertical reaction at the wall. So that's what's called a concentrated point load applied here. And you get more than one load, of course, applied to a beam. What we're going to do today is draw shear force in bending moment diagrams. So a shear force diagram is basically showing the shear force along the entire length of the beam. And a shear force at any section is found by literally summating or adding up all the vertical forces to one side of the section, left or right side, doesn't matter, you get the same answer as, a, as a, whichever side you consider. So it's actually relatively straightforward to calculate the shear force along the length of a beam, particularly for point loads, it gets a little bit more complicated for uniformly distributed loading we're going to look at later on. But for point loads it's quite easy to find the shear force diagram and I'll show you those in a moment. We're also going to draw the bending moment diagram. This shows the bending moment in the beam acting in addition to the shear force. Okay, so a beam is subject to shear forces and it's also subject to, to bending moments. To calculate the bending moment at a point on the beam, it's calculated by considering moments to the left or the right of a particular section we're considering. And you'll see that in the analysis in a moment. So when we're designing a beam, we need to be, understand the shear force distribution along the length of the beam and also the bending moment distribution, the bending moment uh, along the length of the beam. If you're designing lightweight beams, for example, an aircraft structure, often beams are very lightweight because of the weight issue, trying to keep weight to a minimum in aircraft. The shear force diagram is particularly important because you can get shear deflection of beams and shear buckling of beams. So lightweight beams particularly, you need to be careful of the shear force diagram. Also where you've got attachments to the beams, where you've got say rivets uh, or, or bolted joints or welded joints, you're interested in the shear force that are passing through those joints that might be connecting the beam together. So that's where shear force is particularly interested. But all beams you have to design towards the bending moment, um, even if the structural steel or sections which are quite chunky, and shear force is sometimes designed out of them, shear, shear effects are designed out, um, but certainly the bending moment you need to be careful of. So bending moment applies to any beam. Uh, shear force is uh, uh, predominantly associated with sort of lightweight beams or beams where there are attachments to consider. Here's a typical analysis we're going to look at. This is worked out for us. You'll find this in your notes. Um, example 1a. I just outlined it here on the board and then we're going to do a few examples to get our, our head around the process involved here. So in each of the beams, we're going to go through the same process. We're going to be given a beam. We're going to calculate the reactions of the beam using a standard method. We're going to work out the shear force distribution along the beam. We're going to work out the bending moment distribution along the beam. And we're going to sketch in both of the diagrams for the shear force and the bending moment. Okay, so example 1a is a simply supported beam. Simply supported because it's got two reactions. Uh, either end of the beam in this particular case, RA and RD. There are two concentrated point loads applied to the beam, and that's these here, they're the concentrated point loads. And what we've got to do is calculate the reactions at RA and RD on our beam, so here and here. And we've got to calculate the a shear force diagram along the length of the beam, okay, and we've got to calculate the the bending moment diagram for the beam, okay? So that's what we're going to do here. Now, to calculate the reactions, we use the principle of moments, first of all, one of our equilibrium equations, and then we're going to use the second equilibrium equation, the vertical force balance. 
And we're going to do that in every question. That's the process we use all the time. Apply the moment balance, work out one of the reactions, apply the vertical upwards downwards force balance, work out the second reaction. Okay, so whenever you're considering moments on the beam, you have to take moments about a point. That's absolutely essential. And you must tell the engineer where you're taking moments about. So for consistency, I'm going to take moments about the left-hand reaction in all the calculations that we're going to do. So I'm going to take moments about RA, okay, which is left-hand reaction. You can take moments about, in this case, RD, the other reaction. It's no problem. I could take moments about there if I want to, and we get exactly the same answers. But if I take moments about RA, I will find reaction RD. And if I take moments about RD, I will find reaction RA. You can take moments about any position on the beam. I could take moments about point B on the beam, but that will involve then generating simultaneous equations. We'll still get ultimately the same answer, but we'll give ourselves a lot more work to do. So you always take moments about a reaction, and for consistency, I'm going to take moments about the left-hand reaction of each of the beams. So in this case, we're taking moments about RA. So to calculate the reaction, first thing I'm going to do is consider moments, and it's about point A on the beam. I've written this as anti-clockwise moments equals to clockwise moments, okay? You can write them anywhere around you like. You could write clockwise moments equals to anti-clockwise moments. Doesn't matter which way you write them. Um, I've written it that way around because it's convenient for the transposition. And all we do then is consider our moment. Now, don't forget from previous work, moments are defined as forces times their perpendicular distance from the point of rotation. That's the definition of a moment. So if I just consider the applied load to one kilonewton, my line of action, if you like, my force is applied here at point B. I've got one kilonewton applied uh, down that direction and my distance from the uh, pivot point, I'm considering here point A, and perpendicular distance is one meter. So my first moment about A to consider is going to be one kilonewton multiplied by one meter. And the sense of that moment is trying to go in a clockwise direction about point A. So that's why it's on the right hand side. So that's my one multiplied by one here, one kilonewton multiplied by one meter. If I consider the next force on my beam, which is the 5 kilonewton force, that's applied here at point C, my 5 kilonewton force, its perpendicular distance from the point we're considering will be this distance along here. So that's its perpendicular distance, and that's 3 metres from point A. So from point A to point C, it's 3 metres. So that's where I get my 5 kilonewtons multiplied by 3 metres on my uh, equation up here. So this equation I'm building up here is the moments, the clockwise moments, about point A. The, the 5 kilonewtons times the 3 metres is going again in the clockwise sense. So clockwise. That's why I'm on the right-hand side of that equation. No more forces to consider applied to the beam. So now I consider the reaction force, Rd, shown on the right-hand end of the beam. And about the point A, its distance from point A will be 5 metres. That's its perpendicular distance to the line of action of this reaction force Rd. And the sense of Rd multiplied by the 5 metres will be anti-clockwise. So that's why that's shown on the left-hand side of the equation over here. So that 5 times Rd is the anti-clockwise moment of Rd about point A. Okay, so each time when I'm generating my moment equation, I'm just considering are the moments clockwise or anti-clockwise about the point we're considering. The rest is just arithmetic. We're just literally going to evaluate the numbers. So I've got 1 plus 15, and I've divided both sides by 5 to rearrange to find Rd. So Rd in this case is 3.2 kilonewtons. So taking moments about Ra, point A on the beam, I found the reaction Rd, and it's 3.2 kilonewtons. Now I could, if I wanted to, take moments about Rd to find Ra, but that would be a little bit cumbersome. There's no reason to do that. It's much easier to do a vertical force balance. So I'm going to add up all my vertical forces now. So my upward forces equals my downward forces, I'm summating upward forces, equating them to summation of downward forces. And this is a much easier equation to use because I'm just looking at the forces. So upward force on the left-hand side, I would have Ra added to Rd because they're going up. And on the right-hand side, I've got 1 kilonewton added to 5 kilonewtons, and they're coming down. 
Again, I'm just simply going to rearrange the equation to find RA. So RA is going to be the 6 from this line, 1 plus 5 is a 6, minus the RD. We know RD from above, RD is 3.2. So 6 minus the 3.2 is 2.8 kilonewtons. So there's my reactions of the B. And that process is the same in every question. It just gets more complicated because the, there may, may be more loads and maybe a different beam configuration. But that process we do every time we're starting off analysis on a beam. I'm going to get the shear force diagram here for the example one. All right, so we're going to actually draw the shear force diagram. Let's show the sketch on the right hand side. Usually the diagrams are drawn to scale. I'm not really bothered about scale diagrams for us at this level. As long as they're drawn proportionally, that, that would be fine here. All we do with the shear force diagram is consider a point on the beam and look to the left or the right of the beam and literally summate or add up the forces that we see. So if I'm considering point A of my beam here and I'm considering the forces I've got, at point A I have the reaction force of 2.8 kilonewtons acting up. So on my diagram what I will draw is to um, sort of proportion, I will draw up my 2.8 kilonewtons. Here. All right, that's my first line on the diagram. It's a 2.8 uh, kilonewtons. Goal. All right, so that's 2.8, drawn to some kind of scale. If I was to take a point a bit further along the beam, so suppose I take a point, let's just say, arbitrary sake, here, and I look to the left of this point here, then looking to the left, I still see the 2.8. So I would draw my diagram here along to that point there. Okay, if I take a point closer to the uh, point B, it's just say to the left of point B, and I look to the left of that point, what do I see? Well, I still see the 2.8 kilonewtons. So I, I basically draw a horizontal line along here until I get to B. When I'm at point B, then the force of 1 kilonewtons jumps straight down. And sometimes it's nice to consider just before and just after uh, point B, because don't forget these point nodes are, are effectively knife edges. So just fractionally to the left of point B, I see 2.8. As soon as I fractionally go to the right of point B, so I could move my position, say, to here, just fractionally to the right of it, I would see the 1 kilonewton acting down. So all I do on my diagram is take away 1 from 2.8. I'm summating the forces. Just to the right of point B, I look to the left and I see 2.8 acting up and I see 1 acting down. So the net value on the beam is 1.8 kilonewtons. And I just apply the same process as I go from B to C. If I take a point midway between B and C and I look to the left, what do I see? I still see 2.8 acting up and 1 acting down. So I'm still seeing 1.8 kilonewtons on the beam. And you see that right the way across till you get to just fractionally before point C. So if I consider I'm just to the fractionally to the, to the left of point C, and I look into the left, I still see the 1.8 kilonewtons net shear force. But if I go fractionally to the right of point C, what do I uh, see looking to the left? I see now 5 kilonewtons coming down. So now I've got 2.8 up, up. I've got 1 acting down and 5 acting down. That takes the shear force right the way down. The 1.8 kilonewtons and subtract from that 5 kilonewtons takes me down to the negative 3.2. And the same procedure applies as I go between C and D. If I take a point midway between C and D, look to the left of that point, what do I see? I'm still seeing in the negative 3.2 kilonewtons um, all the way along, right to the very end, until at the end I get the 3.2 kilonewtons going up. And that closes the diagram. And they should always close. For equilibrium, these diagrams always must close. So there's my shear force diagram. At any particular point on the beam now, I can work out what the shear force is. So if I have a rivets or a welded joint at that particular point along the beam, I could then analyse that particular joint for that particular shear force to make sure the rivets are capable of taking the shear force, make sure the weld is, etc., etc. Okay. We're going to calculate the bending moments along the beam, and then from that we'll calculate the and draw the bending moment diagram. Now what we do with bending moments is we take moments to the left or the right of a particular point. Um, I'm going to be consistent here. I'm going to take moments to the left every time to begin with. Um, so if I've taken moments about point A, I'll take moments to the left of A, considering point B, take to the left of B, take to the left of C, take the left of D. Uh, an engineer won't do that. An engineer would say I'll take moments to the left of A, take moments to the left of B, and I'll take moments to the right of C and the right of D, because it makes the calculations easier. And I, I will show you that process later on. But just to begin with, to get us going, I'm always going to take moments to the left of the points I'm considering. 
All right, and that's what I've stated here. Take moments to the left of the various points. Now we're talking moments here, not forces. In the previous diagram, we're talking forces, purely the vertical forces on the beam. Now we're considering moments here. And moments, by definition, are forces multiplied by their perpendicular distance from the point of rotation. So if I consider the a position at A, I'm looking at this point on my beam here, the moment to the left of A is zero, and we sometimes state by inspection, because if I look to the left of point A, I see nothing. There is nothing to the left of point A. So therefore, by definition, we have no moments, because don't forget a moment is a force multiplied by a distance, and there's no forces to the left of A, so there's no force times distance to the left of A. There is a force at A, there's a force at A, which is the shear force, but that has no offset from A, so it cannot generate a moment. There's no distance that the RA is from A. It goes straight through A, so it, by definition, it's not have a moment at A, and that's what we saw, uh, and that's what we'll see on our, our diagram. But it does have a shear force at A. If we go back to the shear force diagram, we have the 2.8 kilonewtons at A because the force does act at A. But for moments, you'll see it has no moment at point A. Let's take the next point along our beam. Let's go to point B here. All we do again is look to the left of point B. What do I see looking to the left of point B? I see reaction RA, which is 2.8 kilonewtons from our previous analysis. And the distance we are away is one meter. So my moment to look into the left of it will be 2.8 kilonewtons. In this case, I've used multiplied by one meter. So 2.8 kilonewton meters is the bending moment at point B. We need to be careful with our notation of positive and negative notation. If a force times a distance is trying to do this to the beam, it's trying to put the beam into this kind of shape, which is what the RA multiplied by 1 is doing, that's classified as a positive bending moment. To give it its technical term, that's a sagging beam. If a beam is sagging, we often call that a positive bending moment. If the force times the distance is trying to push the beam into that kind of shape, that's classified as a positive bending moment. You might just say, well, the force is going up, so upward forces times distance are positive. Well, that's true for a horizontal beam, but don't forget beams can be on inclines, beams, beams can be vertical. So, of course, that would no longer apply, that sort of theory. So we always consider the fact if the beam is in the uh, sagging state, uh, that's what makes it a positive beam. So that's why I've called it a positive bending moment here. You'll see in later questions, we'll end up with negative bending moments as well. So that's my bending moment to left of B. If I now go to the left of point C and I look at the bending moments there, so MC I'm calculating, now I see 2.8 kilonewtons over here, the RA, and that's multiplied by 3 meters away from point C. So RA 2.8 multiplied by the distance of 3. And I subtract from that, this is now the, the hogging beam, We'll see here, because the force times the distance, one kilonewton multiplied by two meters, about point C, that force will try and do this to the beam. It will try and hog it, try and push it in this direction. So that's what's called a hogging beam or a negative bending moment. And so in this case, I will subtract from the 2.8 times 3, the uh, 1 times 2. So 1 is the 1 kilonewton here, and it's multiplied by the 2 meters. All right, so 1 kilonewton times by 2 meters here, and that gives me the bending moment that's subtracting from the RA times the 3 meters. And that evaluates the 6.4 kilonewton meters. And if I take moments to the left of D, now I should get a zero because if I take moments to the right of D, I can see there's nothing there. So there's nothing there that can be at no moment at D. So I'm going to take moments to the left for consistency, but I should get zero. So now I've got the 2.8 kilonewtons at the left-hand end. That's now multiplied by the 5 meters. It's 5 meters from D, so 2.8 multiplied by 5. I'm then going to subtract my 1 kilonewton multiplied by 4 meters. Okay, so that's where I get my 4 meters. So the distance of 1 kilonewton applied at B from Point D is 1 multiplied by 4 meters, 4 meters of distance, that's what I'm showing here, and the negative 1 multiplied by 4. And I've also now got the 5 kilonewtons to consider, that's 2 meters away from D. And that, again, that's a negative sense, so that will be subtracting 5 multiplied by the distance of 2 meters. If you do evaluate that, you'll find that's 0, which we'd expect. All we do for a 
bending moment diagram is literally, literally plot the points on the diagram. So from here we know that MA is equal to zero, so you plot the MA, you've got MB is equal to 2.8 kilonewtons, so 2.8. We've got the value of MC is 6.4, and we know that the uh, MD is going to be zero. So there's my diagram. You literally just join the dots up for the for the bending moment diagram. And this moment. There should be straight lines as well, by the way. Not very straight, is it? But there you go. All right. If a point loads uh, applied to the beam, the bending moment has always got linear lines between the points. There's the full work solution there, just for reference. Okay, let's have a go at a question together. I'm going to run through these quite rapidly here. For question one, we're going to work out the reactions at RA and RC this time, just where I've labelled the beam. It's our, RA is a left hand then, but RC is actually um, inside the length of the beam here. Um, and we're going to draw the shear force of minimum diagram. That's answers are given to us here. So the first thing we're going to do is calculate the reaction. So let's do that straight away. So find reactions. And if you follow the process that we used in the example, we're going to take moments about a point. I'm going to take moments about point A. I'm going to state that. Um, I'll use the same notations they used in the example for this question. So shorthand, it's summation of all the anti-clockwise moments is equal to summation of the clockwise moments. So it doesn't matter which way round you write them, whichever you prefer. So we're taking moments about point A. So about this point over here. So let's consider the moments we've got. Looking at the uh, geometry, I've got 20 kilonewtons here. And that's multiplied by a distance of 2 metres in its clockwise about uh, point A that I'm considering. Right hand side of my equation here. So equals 2. So clockwise moments will be 20 and multiplied by 2 metres. And it's now it's going in a clockwise direction. Well, yes, there is. I've now got the 10 kilonewtons here the end of the beam here, and that's multiplied by 8 metres. Again, we can see about A, that's going in the clockwise sense. We try and think of the senses you've got about the points, so it's clockwise sense about point A. So I simply just add that to my right-hand side of my equation. So I'm adding here the 10 kilonewtons. I'm working in kilonewtons here. Sometimes we'll work in newtons, and that's multiplied by the 8 metres. Okay. Now, with the anti-clockwise moments then, well, I can see I've got the reaction at RC here, and that's multiplied by 5 metres from point A, and that will be going in this anti-clockwise sense. That's a sense of the RC multiplied by 5 metres. On my left-hand side of the equation, I've got the RC, I don't know what it is, but it's multiplied by, in this case, it's 5 metres. Always the distance from the point we're considering. Okay, evaluating that, I'll let you do the numbers on that. I'm just going to go straight for the final answer. We're just going to evaluate the right-hand side, work it out, and then divide by 5. And I find that's 24 kilonewtons. Can I let you do the, the number work on that? So you're just simply um, working out the right-hand side. So it's 40, add 80, 120, then divide that by a 5, and you get 24 kilonewtons. And then to find the other reaction, to find reaction RC, I'm just going to uh, summate vertical forces. So my next e equation I'm going to use is summate the upward forces and equate to the summation of the downward forces. And this is the easy equation. All we do is look what forces are going up, what are coming down. Going up in this case, I've got RA and I've got RC. Now RC is actually 24, so I can write that in as 24. And what's coming down, in this case, I've got the 20 and the 10, so 20. Rearranging the equation to find Ra, Ra is equal to 6 kilonewtons. Okay, um, I'm going to work out the bending moment there, so I'm not going to work out the shear force actually, because it's very easy to draw the shear force on the diagram straight away. When you're only dealing with point loads, it's very easy to draw a shear force diagram uh, uh, on the fly, so to speak. So I'm going to draw the shear force diagram uh, in a moment on the next slide and show you how that's developed. So now we're going to calculate bending moments by taking moments to the left-hand side of points A, B, C and D as we go across the beam. So considering moments to the left-hand side of A, looking to the left, there's nothing there. The bending moment at A must equal to zero. Now consider bending moments to the left of point B on our beam. Looking to the left of B, what force times distances do we see? 
we see 6 kilonewtons at the end multiplied by 2 meters. That's causing the beam to sag about B, so that's a positive bending moment. The bending moment to the left of B will be 6 kilonewtons multiplied by 2 meters, so 12 kilonewton meters is the bending moment at B. Now considering moments to the left of point C on our beam. Looking to the left of point C, we now have 6 kilonewtons multiplied by 5 meters away from C. Again, that's a positive bending moment. So 6 kilonewtons multiplied by 5 meters. And also looking to the left of point C, we now have the 20 kilonewton force acting down. And that's 3 meters away from point C. The effect of that moment is to hog the beam. So that's a negative bending moment. So now we subtract the 20 kilonewtons multiplied by 3 meters. Evaluating MC is negative 30 kilonewton meters. And finally, for consistency, I'm going to consider moments to the left of point D. We can clearly see that moments to the right of point D are zero. But just for the practice of calculating moments, I'm going to consider moments to the left of point D. So to the left of point D, I now see the 6 kilonewtons multiplied by 8 meters as a positive bending moment. So 6 kilonewtons multiplied by 8 meters. I still see the 20 kilonewtons multiplied by 6 meters. And that's again a negative bending moment. So we subtract the 20 kilonewtons multiplied by 6 meters. But now I also see the RC reaction of 24 kilonewtons multiplied by 3 meters. Again, producing a positive moment about D. So I have to add 24 kilonewtons multiplied by 3 meters. Evaluating MD is equal to zero, which of course we would expect because taking moments to the right of point D, we can clearly see a zero. So there's my bending moment calculations for the beam shown in question one. So here's my shear force and bending diagram. Just gonna wander through the shear force with you and uh, just draw the shear force, literally draw it on the screen here um, as we go across the beam. So thinking of the shear force diagram, that's this line sort of shown here. On the left hand end, we've got six kilonewtons acting up. So plotting the shear force, that will go up to six. I've got it 6,000 here because I'm plotted in terms of newtons. So that goes up to six. So as I move from the beam from A towards B, as I get closer and closer to B, I still look into the left and I still see that I've got six kilonewtons acting up until I get just past the B. Imagine I've just gone slightly past the point load position. I see 20 come down, so 20 kilonewtons acting down. So I've got six kilonewtons up, 20 down. That takes me down to the negative 14 kilonewtons. Again, I'm using uh, newtons here, so down to negative 14,000. Okay, then going from between B and C, what do I see when I look to the left of any point I consider and along this portion of the beam here, looking to the left, I still see the same net force, net shear force of the negative 14,000. So that'll be a horizontal line all the way to C. And I go just past of C, go to the right of C, look to the left of, uh, of that point. What do I see then? I'm gonna see the uh, 24 kilonewtons now acting up. So I'm down at negative 14 kilonewtons effectively here, and I'm gonna add 24 kilonewtons. That will take me up to 10 kilonewtons, or 10,000 newtons is drawn on the scale shown. Again, it's a vertical line drawn up. And if I move between point C and D here, again, looking to the left of any point I wanna consider, looking to the left of that point, I will always see the same net shear force of the 10,000 newtons acting up until I get to the very end of the beam and I see I've got 10 kilonewtons acting down and I'll close the beam. The beam is now closed back to zero for equilibrium. So very easy to draw the uh, shear force diagram when you've got point loads applied to a simply supported beam. It's really quite straightforward. I just do it literally on the fly on the diagram. As I said, for the for plotting the bending moments, uh, we literally take the values that we've calculated, shown here on a slide. So at B, I've got 12 kilonewtons, and at C, I've got the negative 30 kilonewtons. And all we do is literally plot them on the diagram. So at point B, there's my 12,000 newton meters, 12 kilonewton meters, and there's my negative 30,000 newton meters, or uh, negative 30 kilonewton meters. And we just literally then join the lines up.
And notice I put the no positive notation down for the shear force that diagram. I've got my positive notation shown here from a bending moment diagram, positive notation shown here. We normally do that for completeness. That's the, the two types of uh, positive notation we're using throughout the presentation. So this one is for you to have a go at. All right. This is slightly more complicated than the fact that the loads are given in tons. So you're going to have to work them out in terms of um, newtons, first of all, but I'm sure we can convert tons to newtons. And then the process is identical to what we've done in the example. So I'm going to take moments about A, as always. But instead of doing the clockwise anti-clockwise balance, I'm actually going to summate all the moments and equate them to zero. So I'm just going to write down a slightly different approach here. Summation of all my moments are going to equal to zero. It's just another way of doing exactly the same thing. I'll say clockwise moments are positive. So that would be in this case a positive uh, 29.43, my force multiplied by my distance of 1.2. And then I would have a positive 9.81 kilonewtons. And that's multiplied by the distance of 3.2 meters. And then I have negative RD multiplied by 4. That's going in the opposite sense. That's going in an anti-clockwise sense about A. So that's why it's a negative 4RD. And I equate that to 0. Okay, so just another way of writing exactly the same equation from the previous page. Instead of writing summation of the anti-clockwise moments is equal summation of the clockwise moments, I'm just summating all the moments and equating them to 0. And evaluating the equation, reaction RD is equal to 16.677 kilonewtons. We now need to find reaction RA, and to do that, we will undertake a vertical force balance. This time, my notation states it's summation of all the vertical forces equals to zero, and upward forces are considered positive. So from my diagram, I can clearly see that the RA reaction is upward, so that's positive, and the RD reaction force, which we calculated to be 16.677 kilonewtons, is upwards, so that's positive. And the downward forces in this case are 29.43 kilonewtons, so that's negative 29.43, and 9.81 kilonewtons down, so that's negative 9.81 in my equation. That equals to zero for equilibrium. Rearranging and evaluating, reaction RA is 22.563 kilonewtons. There's my calculations. So my reaction, from my moment balance, and I'm taking moments about point A as always, and I'm summating the clockwise moments are positive here, so I get RD, and then summating the vertical forces, so you should get, whichever way you method you use, you should get a reaction at RA about 22.56-ish. And what you'll see I've done here in summating moments, I'm trying to speed my process up here, and I'm evaluating my bending moments, I'm going to summate moments to the left of points A and B, because that's fairly straightforward to do. So left of A is zero, by inspection. And then to the left of B, I see RA, reaction force multiplied by 1.2 meters. So that works out my bending moment at B. And then to sort of speed myself up a little bit, I'm now going to summate moments to the right of C and D. Just speed the process up a little bit. So to the right of C, my bending moment would be reaction RD multiplied by the distance of 0 0.8, shown here. And that equals to 13.3 kilonewton meters. And my bending moment to the right of point D would be zero by inspection. So just a slight way of speeding ourselves up, rather than taking moments to the left always across the beam, which gives us quite a calculation to do for the point D. Again, I don't want to sort of confuse you, but I'm just trying to, this level to give you these options of how to lay out your work. Shear force and bending moment diagrams then. So looking at point A on the left-hand end of the beam, we've got 22.563 kilonewtons acting up. So I would draw that up on my diagram. And then between point A and B, there's nothing else applied I can see. So that will be a constant a shear force all the way across to, to B. So just before B, if you think of a point just to the left of B, I get my uh, 22.563. And then just to the right of B, I suddenly see the 29,430 newtons. Uh, so applying my 29,430 newtons there at point B, 
takes me down to 6,867. So, uh, and again, I can see as I go across the beam between B and C, there's nothing else applied. So that'd be a constant shear force until I get to point C. As I go past point C, fractionally past point C, I get now the 9,810 newtons. And that's coming down now to 9,810 9, newtons. Down, takes me down to that level, and of course, at the end, I can see I've got my 16.677 kinetics acting up. That goes as a diagram back to zero again. So this is my shear force diagram, and of course, the bending moment diagram. I'm literally going to plot the points I've calculated. So, from my calculations, MB was about 27 kilonewton meters and 13.3 kilonewton meters for MC. So, I'm just literally plotting those points. So those points are plotted here and here. Okay, just linear lines between the points that we've um, plotted on our diagrams. Let me see. Okay, hope you get a hang of the these little diagrams. A note of interest for question three. Symmetrical beam with symmetrical loading. 20 kilonewtons on the left-hand side here, 20 kilonewtons on the right-hand side here. We've got 70 kilonewtons acting spot in the middle, and our reactions are symmetrically distributed about the beam. When you get something like this, we usually state that by symmetry, we can see reaction uh, RB in this case will equal reaction RD in this case. There's, they're going to be the same values. And all we've got to do is total up the, the, the forces applied and we will, uh, we will find the um, reactions. So, so 70 add 40 effectively, that will be 110 kilonewtons. And we'll simply divide that by 2 to get the 55 kilonewton reaction force. So that's just a just a, a sort of something to be aware of by symmetry. If you can use symmetry, engineers like symmetry, it helps with designs, helps with analysis. So if you do see it, that symmetrical type of loading, then you could you could just put down by by inspection and by symmetry the reactions are. Okay. So it's just a point in, in passing there for that. I'm not going to go through that one now. I'm going to skip on from there. Uh, if you want to, you can do that, you can. And I won't bother with this one either because of time constraints. I just tried to show this as like a practical illustration of what really a beam is. This beam in this particular example is actually a shaft on which a pulley is located. So the beam is the shaft here. And we've got forces, going back to what we did with our, our belt drives earlier in the year, we've got a tension in the belts. So they're showing a T1, T2 will be a sort of tight side and a slack side tension, that kind of thing in the belts. Adding those together will give us a total force applied from the pulley on the shaft. So in this case, looking at the figures in the table there, we can see that adding the, the two tensions together is 1750 newtons. And then we would idealize the beam by placing that force at the location where the pulley is. And then using the geometry, you can see we can clearly analyze it as a simply supported beam to work out the reactions. Just notice the forces are going different directions, but that doesn't make any difference to our analysis. We're still going to take moments about point A, find RC, and add up the vertical forces to find RA. Same process involved, just the, the applied force in this case is up the page, not down the page. So the reactions are down in this case. That's just a scenario that shows you how to sort of idealize the practical example into a sort of uh, just a simply supported beam here. Now, there, again, there's lots of subjectivities here because some engineers will say, well, hang on a minute. They've got really substantial clamping here of the of the shaft. So to say it's a simply supported beam is, is a bit pessimistic because there will be quite a, a lot of moment support, um, no doubt, from these bearings. It will actually, you know, it's almost like having built in at both ends. So some engineers would not sort of be happy with the idealization done here. They might want to see that really as a as a fixed end here and a fixed end here which uh, does complicate the analysis for us, um, but that would reduce the bending moments in the B and the shaft. Um, but for a simplification of the analysis and to be conservative, treating it as simply supported would give you the worst scenario on the bending of the shaft. So again, you can see it's quite an art in, in applying this information, but I just tried to put that in to show you a little bit of idealization engineers have to do to take a practical situation and idealize as what is actually a, a simple support beam in this case. If you want to do that for yourself, you're welcome to do that, but um, I'm going to leave that one for now. And here's the full work solution for question four for reference. It relates to the shaft and pulley system shown in the sketch here. The applied load is from the pulley via the belt tensions, applied at point B. In this case, our reactions are at RA and at RC. 
use the calculation for reactions. It's a shear force diagram. And use the calculation for the bending moments and the bending moment diagram.